Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So we have been discussing how uh, we can use uh, linear time invariant systems to model uh, uh, properties of neurons or uh, the uh, stimulus to response transformation of neurons. And uh, we came up uh, with a model or a series of steps uh, which we describe as the model for the neuron or in fact from the stimulus to the spike trains. Uh, which involves a linear time invariant system followed by few other um, blocks. And so to remind ourselves, um, we have the stimulus as xt. Um, then uh, we said that we have an LTI here, which is as you know completely represented by its impulse response ht that is uh, if we have the system if xt is delta t then the output of the system uh, so xt and output of the system is yt in case of xt is equal to delta t yt is h of t that is the impulse response of the system and we said that ht is uh, all we need to know about the lti system uh, in order to uh, um, be able to uh, model the behavior or the output for any given input. And uh, followed by this, so if this is yt, we said that yt is akin to the uh, membrane potential and uh, so it passes through a static nonlinearity which can be of any type but at least uh, the, the most common type being that we have a threshold and then some saturation which is usually modeled with a sigmoid like an activation function. So, and we have said that this can be any arbitrary nonlinearity um, which uh, we will see that uh, in the process of our um, determining HT it does not matter what kind of nonlinearity this is. Uh, that is producing the instantaneous firing rate lambda t which is the driving function for the inhomogeneous Poisson process and what we are observing are uh, basically uh, a point process being driven by the lambda t uh, and that is our pt which is a series of uh, impulses that is our pt uh, is described as summation of delta t minus t i where i varies from 1 to capital N suffix t where capital T is the period over which we are uh, observing the spikes and that is the period over which uh, more or less we have the stimulus x t and uh, we need to understand the behavior of this system and we said that all we need to do is find out this ht and then we will be done once we have estimated the ht if it is good we will be easily able to predict or find out what this nonlinear function is and uh, hence be able to model the system and uh, so in order to do that uh, let us uh, think of uh, simply a linear time invariant system. Let us forget about the other two blocks here and uh, let us say we consider only the first part of it where we have simply an LTI uh, whose impulse response is HT. We have an input XT which is a random process and it is producing a output YT 
which is also a random process and we will assume uh, the white stain stationarity and ergodicity uh, in these uh, processes uh, to make things simpler. And um, I mean they, they are not bad assumptions because given uh, the kind of uh, results we know that exist uh, by using this kind of modeling, we find them to be very good in many cases as we had discussed especially in the peripheral regions um, and slightly above, but it gets uh, difficult to use these models as we go higher up in the hierarchy as we have discussed. So, the we introduced the idea of the cross correlation function that is r y x tau. We are saying tau because we are assuming uh, wide sense stationarity and uh, we uh, if we want to find out what r y x tau is, we essentially need to calculate the expectation of our y t plus tau and x t this product. The expectation of this is the cross correlation function uh, where uh, y and x the points that we are considering at every uh, instant are tau apart. And uh, from here from this being an LTI linear time invariant system, we also know that our y t can be written as the convolution of x t and h t or in other words we have uh, an integral over minus infinity to infinity our um, x t minus u h u d u. So, we have simply replaced the dummy variable uh, what we, uh, tau in this case by u. If you recollect our uh, definition of the convolution, uh, we had instead of u, we had tau. Now, we have a different tau here and so we have to introduce a different uh, variable name here which we have taken to be u. So, we can use this y t based on uh, the x t and h t and we can plug it in into this y t plus tau. And so, what is our y t plus tau? So, if we can if we write it here our y t plus tau will turn out to be integral minus infinity to infinity we replace t by t plus tau x t plus tau min um, sorry. t plus uh, tau minus u and h u uh, d u. Um, so, in essence the cross correlation function r y x becomes uh, the expectation of we let us say we write the x t first and then the integral x t plus tau minus um, again x t plus uh, tau minus u h u and d u. So, we can interchange the expectation and the integration uh, because the integration is over u. Um, so, and uh, it does not matter if we take the x t in and the expectation in it can be since the expectation is a linear operator. We have the integral let us say integral is over u. So, let us write the differential first d u. We have h u which is uh, not uh, part of the expectation um, and then we have the expectation because a h u is a constant in that sense uh, expectation of x t plus tau minus u into x t. Um, so, we have simply interchanged the expectation and the integral 
and we have taken h u out of the expectation uh, because uh, it is constant uh, function and so uh, it is not a random variable and so if we now look at this expectation it looks a very familiar function where uh, if you look at this uh, representation of r y x tau with is expectation of y t plus tau x uh, t if we take x t in the uh, if we take x t plus tau minus u instead of tau here and this is x t this simply becomes r x x tau minus u that is the autocorrelation function of x and the variable indexed is uh, the argument is tau minus u. So, this becomes integral d u h u and r x x tau minus u. So, now if you look at it again uh, d u h u r x x tau minus u and compare this with the convolution uh, definition convolution equation we have uh, again that h u and x t minus u instead of x t minus u we have a different function here which, which is a function of tau with and that is the autocorrelation function tau um, uh, in, in there. So, this is also a convolution, but it is only that this is a convolution between h tau and r x x tau. So, what we show here is that uh, in this kind of scenario where we have white sense stationarity um, and we have a random process as input and output is also a random process of an LTI. Then the cross correlation function between the output and the input is related to the autocorrelation function of the input through the impulse response. Just like the output of the system is connected to the input of the system through the impulse response through a convolution. Here we see that even the autocorrelation or the cross correlation function is simply the convolution of the autocorrelation function that is the course cross correlation of the input itself with itself and the impulse response. So, in a sense what we have here is that our r y x um, tau is nothing but h tau convolved with r x x tau. This is the autocorrelation function, this is the cross correlation function of the output with the input and this is the autocorrelation of the input. Now, if we assume that our input because the input is uh, our choice at least for these cases. Uh, we can create the input ourselves and play that kind of stimulus, use that kind of stimulus uh, and record the spike trains uh, from the neuron. So, if we create the stimulus to be such that um, our x t is Gaussian white noise. then uh, this uh, relation uh, r y x tau with r x x tau uh, becomes much more simpler and uh, much more simple and uh, that is because when we say Gaussian white noise process if the input is a Gaussian white noise process it simply means that at every instant we are drawing uh, the value of the random process from a Gaussian distribution and if every instant the value is independent of any value elsewhere for of that um, process. So, 
that means if we think of the autocorrelation function that is how uh, the expectation of uh, x t plus tau and x t since these are totally uh, unrelated they are um, independent of each other. So, this is always 0 for all tau not equal to 0. And uh, in fact, what we find what we can show is that at tau equal to 0, we will have an impulse uh, from the from the definition of uh, this expectation for ergodic process when we do the integral, it will simply turn out to be an uh, impulse at 0. And so, the autocorrelation function of a white noise process R x x tau is nothing but delta tau and uh, it can be scaled by sigma square depending on the power or the variance of that Gaussian from which we are drawing and that determines the power in that noise um, or the energy in that noise. So, this sigma square is nothing but the standard deviation or the variance of that Gaussian white noise and here we will uh, also assume that our mu x is 0, uh, the mean value is 0, the 0 mean Gaussian white noise, then uh, we have the autocorrelation function R x x tau is uh, simply sigma square uh, delta tau. So, that means if I were to draw this, this axis is tau, if I were to draw this is 0, then uh, the autocorrelation function is simply in red, it will be 0 everywhere uh, uh, other than other than at 0 here and we represent the impulse at 0 with uh, this arrow and this height is taken to be uh, sigma square. So, now uh, the convolution of h tau and r x x tau that we um, have here, uh, if we now use the autocorrelation function as described here, then our r y x tau now becomes uh, the convolution of h tau and this uh, sigma square delta tau. So, and convolution is nothing but an integral and the sigma square can come out of the integral and here we have uh, essentially h uh, tau delta t minus tau d tau. Um, so, we have uh, changed the variable to t now, um, I am sorry, we have to do it with tau. So, uh, this because this is uh, tau, we need to have this um, t here and I am sorry, um, we will have uh, tau minus t uh, dt. So, um, so h t uh, and delta t minus uh, tau minus t dt, we showed that from the property of the Dirac delta function or this delta, uh, such an integral is simply uh, the value of the function h t evaluated at uh, this argument as 0 that is at t equal to tau. So, that means this simply becomes sigma square h of tau. Um, so, in a sense uh, what we have now had is we have uh, in, we have removed the uh, uh, the input function from here or input process from here uh, because of its because of the uh, white Gaussian noise assumption about the stimulus or in fact in our control that is the stimulus. So, uh, that is gone and r y x tau is simply proportional to the impulse response. 
uh, in the case of white Gaussian noise input. So, the first relation that we have for uh, uh, LTI and uh, this kind of situation is that our Ryx is going to be proportional to the impulse response of the system. So, if we um, recollect here, if this is uh, our model at the top of the page, then the if we somehow can get the cross correlation y and x, uh, then that is going to be proportional to the impulse response. And uh, that means um, we can uh, get an estimate of the impulse response, uh, of course, to a, within a scaling factor. And uh, so, if we have access to this yt, which is the membrane potential, for that uh, we would require to patch onto a neuron and uh, know that yt. But here we are uh, given the problem of recording the spikes extracellularly. So, we have those all or none events and we are recording only this pt, only this pt here that is the spike train. From this spike train, we need to be able to somehow connect it with this Ryx tau or hence uh, our H tau. So, um, now if we consider, so uh, let us say we have this system uh, Xt as input, then we have yt, um, then we have our uh, non-linearities, the static non-linearity, and we have lambda t, and then we have this uh, point process uh, production which is giving pt. So, uh, now if we consider pt, what we essentially have over time are instances where spikes are occurring, that is the Ti's. At the different Ti's, the spikes are occurring, that is all we have. And uh, if we now discretize this time axis and create a new uh, discrete uh, variable uh, or process, uh, let us say Q where uh, we are breaking down this entire uh, time duration. Let us say uh, oh, we are recording over uh, the period capital T as we have uh, said earlier. And so, let us say this is 0 to capital T and we break it down into let us say M bins and the bins are of size delta that is our uh, delta times m equals t and the delta is so small that there can be at most one spike in that bin. And uh, so, we can uh, actually replace uh, the rate with uh, probability, I mean uh, we will see in a minute. So, let us say we have this delta sized bins here. So, we have delta sized bins here and there can be at most one spike in each of those bins. Um, so, the bins are essentially 0 or 1 that is the q i uh, is either takes on a value either 0 or 1 in the ith bin and the probability of this q i probability of q i equal to 1 would simply be um, our if the rate function is uh, lambda t is simply lambda at delta i times delta. So, if delta is small enough. So, this is simply going to be the probability that q i equals 1 if delta is sufficiently small because uh, that is 
the rate that is the number of spikes possible per unit time and since only one spike is possible in a bin uh, is simply multiplying by the uh, bin width we can get the probability of uh, spike. Uh, so, keeping uh, this uh, relation in mind uh, we can uh, go forward with one more catch here that is since this delta is very small, we will assume that our R P um, X, let us say we will cross correlate the pulse train uh, or the spike train with uh, the input X is going to be close to our R Q X. Um, there is a little bit of uh, jump uh, here, uh, but uh, for the purposes of this course, we will uh, see say that uh, this approximation is valid, although there are a number of mathematical treatments that uh, require that are required in order to make this assumption because we have a, a delta function in the PT from which we are coming to the RQX. Um, but this approximation is uh, pretty good in the sense that uh, if we think that delta is going small and small and small and almost uh, infinitesimally small, then our QI and the, the process Q and the uh, process PT are essentially the same. The only difference is that instead of the uh, delta function, we will have unit impulses in discrete time. Uh, in Q. So, this is uh, this is the how to connect these two uh, with each other. So, now um, let us say we want to compute RPX. So, from here we have that RPX that means we have this XT and uh, with a number of steps, we finally have our PT, which is equal to summation delta T minus Ti. And this I is going from 1 to capital N suffix capital T. So, in order to uh, compute RPX, we need to get the expectation of the product of uh, pt and x uh, t minus tau or uh, um, pt plus tau and x t. So, since uh, the pt is not, uh, I mean we will not be uh, uh, getting pt over an infinite duration, we can only estimate rpx and let us say that, that estimate is rpx hat and um, that can be written as our uh, average so rpx at tau is going to be the average of so 1 by nt for each of the spikes integral over 0 to capital t we have x um, t plus um, I'm sorry, x t minus tau and uh, summation delta t um, p t. Um, so, x t minus tau times p t, which is summation delta t minus t i, i equals 1 to capital N t and here we have dt. So, now if we take the summation out, we have 1 over nt and summation i equals 1 to capital N suffix capital T and here we have an integral of x t minus tau and uh, delta t minus t i and dt. So, again we are posed with the situation where we have integral uh, involving a delta function and another function and so it is simply 
the evaluation of uh, of the uh, function the other function in this case x at uh, wherever this uh, delta function is valid that is at t equals t i. So, we evaluate x t i minus tau. So, this we can replace the integral with uh, uh, with that calculation and it will simply be summation over 1 to capital N suffix capital N t x t i minus tau. So, what we have is an estimate of the cross correlation of the spike train, spike train and the input. So, and what is this, uh, this uh, x t i minus tau, if you think about it, let us say we have, uh, this is our x t over uh, time, this is the, the time axis and uh, let us say we have a p t along this 0 to t as spikes at this time point, this time point, this time point, this time point, this time point and so on. So, this is each of these spikes are at t i. So, this is our t 1, t 2 and so on. And so, what we are doing here in this sum that came out to be the estimate of uh, our cross correlation uh, between p and x is that we for and it is a function of tau. So, tau will be varying uh, between some uh, minus some particular t to some plus positive some particular t. So, here is let us say this is the tau axis and this is tau equals 0 and we are we are plotting r p x hat as a function of tau. Uh, so, what we need that for each and every tau here on this axis, we need to compute this sum uh, and average or and divide by capital N T. So, for each of these tau's, if you see that at t 1, if we take uh, for t 1 at a particular tau behind uh, t 1, let us say, or a particular tau after t 1, what we will have here is the value of, um, if this is tau, this is our x t 1 minus tau. If this is tau, this is our x t 1 minus tau. Now, for every tau on this axis that is essentially throughout uh, a window of tau around that spike, it is simply this x t i minus tau is simply the entire waveform of x over this uh, window. So, that is the snippet as a function of tau for t 1. Similarly, for t 2, we will have a snippet or window around t 2, which is taking this waveform. And similarly, for each of those spikes and for and they, they are aligned by tau because if we put each of these the, the t 1 time point and the surrounding uh, window which is the tau axis and average over all the spikes, we are simply taking the average of these snippets around the spike. And uh, that turns out to be what we call the spike triggered average. So, because given every spike, we are taking the window around it of the waveform and averaging that for every spike. And so, what we will see that uh, since the stimulus, this is the relation, uh, since the response is caused by the stimulus, what we will find is that when we do this averaging, the values for values tau greater than 0, this will hover around 0 and come down to noise levels. Because 
the subsequent stimulus for that spike does not matter in terms of producing that spike because um, essentially we are averaging the stimulus preceding the spike and after the spike uh, since the stimulus is not going to produce uh, any spike from the future uh, period we will this sum should go down to zero and that it does and in the past time this tau with a latency we may get certain uh, kind of function which is the spike triggered average. So, uh, that is this uh, this this particular function is proportional to r p x hat. So, now we have introduced the idea of the spike triggered average and um, we have also said that in our uh, model that we have um, sorry in our model that we have uh, we want we we need to finally relate uh, the spike train to the cross correlation between y and x and to do that we have for the first step taken is we have looked at the cross correlation of p and x that is the pulse train and x and uh, we find that that cross correlation is nothing but the spike triggered average. So, in the next lecture we will now connect the spike triggered average which is the cross correlation between p and x or an estimate of the cross correlation between p and x uh, with the r y x which is proportional to the impulse response h t which is what we are after uh, in terms of modeling this entire system. Thank you.